This is the Best Friends Podcast, dedicated to sharing the people and programs that are ending the killing of cats and dogs in America's animal shelters. You'll hear from animal welfare leaders from across the movement who will share the innovative and collaborative work that are creating life-saving successes in communities of all sizes. Today is Tuesday, May the 12th. I'm John Dunn, and this is episode number 10. Now, for the first double-digit episode, we wanted to roll out the big guns. So I'm thrilled to be able to bring to you my conversation with the kitten lady herself, Hannah Shaw. Not only has she been able to bring the issue of neonatal kittens to seriously millions of people through her organization, Orphan Kitten Club. She's saving lives and the success they're having raising money. They're now able to fund the kitten saving work of organizations across the country. Now, before we get into that, I'd like you to please go to the website, bestfriends.org slash podcast. Now, today, Best Friends CEO Julie Castle had an op-ed in USA Today where she looks into the not-so-distant future to what may be called community-based sheltering, the role of animal shelters and the community in a post-COVID world. Now, as we've covered on this podcast, the pandemics brought this conversation to the forefront. Julie's op-ed is a must-read, and I'm not just saying that because she's my boss. We'll have the link up on the website, bestfriends.org slash podcast. Now to our main event today, Hannah Shaw. I had the pleasure of meeting Hannah for the first time in 2014 at the Best Friends National Conference. And since then, it's fair to say that things have changed for both of us. I'm now hosting a podcast, and Hannah is known to millions of people around the world as the Kitten Lady. Yeah, I'm excited uh, to chat with you. Yeah. Uh, If for no other reason, Hannah, then you're going to get me a ton of listens. (laughs) I hope so. You're going to get so many people listening because you're this rock star. Aw, thanks. It's true. Thank you. Are we recording right now or are you just being nice to me? Both. Okay. <laughs> um, but I think that's uh, where we should start. I made the joke to you ahead of time that I think everybody listening to this will have an idea of who you are. I can tell you one listener who I know won't, uh, one of the biggest fans of the show, is my dad. Oh, well, hi, dad. Uh, he says he's listened to at least a third of the episodes. But uh, for my dad and the few who may not be aware of you, Hannah Shaw, the kitten lady, Who are you and what do you do? Sure. Uh, So I'm Hannah Shaw. I am known by a lot of people as Kitten Lady. And I am a humane educator and animal rescuer who focuses on neonatal kittens. So that means, you know, these very young kittens, newborn kittens through adoption age is my focus area. Um, I do a lot of education work, teaching people how to care for kittens, um, helping animal shelters and animal rescues uh, start and sustain good programs for kittens. Uh, I do a lot of advocacy work. I also am the founder of a nonprofit called Orphan Kitten Club, and we have programs um, in California, nursery programs, TNR programs, and then we also have a grant program uh, that is national. So we uh, help organizations fund um, their neonatal kitten programs. So uh, I am just a kitten obsessed person. I live in a house with multiple kitten nurseries in it and kittens coming out of my eyeballs every single day. Uh, So I I really love um, focusing on this population. It's a big passion for me. And, uh, you know, in terms of my own rescue work, I tend to focus on the more vulnerable kitten populations. So, um, you know, newborn kittens, preemie kittens, special needs kittens, kittens with congenital differences, medical issues, um, you know, hot mess kittens are my my fave. You are very successful at what you do. You have 1.1 million likes on Instagram. Yeah, I have a lot of people on Instagram. Um, And then YouTube is my other big uh, platform. I have over a million subscribers on YouTube, which is uh, really my favorite platform um, because that's where I create all of my educational videos. I have um, a couple hundred educational videos so that when people are looking up information about how to care for a kitten. They don't have to be like I was in the beginning and feel totally alone and clueless and like nobody's there to help them. Um, I try to kind of be a accessible friend to anyone who wants to help kittens. So um, the YouTube channel is really a place I love to point to p- point people to, and that's um, just youtube.com slash kitten lady. Uh, it's got a lot of 
a lot of education and a lot of just fun on there. And and your content is so engaging. Uh, everybody loves kittens, obviously. But I couldn't just put a video with kittens on YouTube uh, and get the response that you do. It's the way you do it. And I think is what has uh, made you so successful among many things. And I think when people go and see the content that you produce, I think they will see that. It's very well produced. It's full of great information. And of course, kittens. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Well, I mean, sometimes people go, how do you get the kittens to be so cute? I'm like, there's no getting kittens to be cute. I mean, Kittens are, they have that part handled. Um, but yeah, I think producing quality content is something as an advocate that is important to me because I don't want people to just, you know, see the cuteness of the kitten, but to actually hear the story and, um, you know, take that one step further to uh, learning something, some kind of educational piece that they can use in their life to help an animal or to become empowered to sign up to foster or whatever it is. Uh, I really believe in teaching through storytelling uh, because, you know, it's one thing to read a pamphlet or, you know, read a website that's made by somebody who, you know, has not actually gotten involved in the issue. But um, it's another thing entirely to watch a video of someone saying, this is my first time doing this. I don't actually know what I'm doing, but I'm going to take you along for the journey. And here we go. And you get to follow the whole journey. And by the end, we're all more educated, you know. Um, I try to really share uh, the ups and downs of everything I go through in rescue so that other people um, can learn through what I have going on rather than having to have all of us recreate the wheel all the time. Can you give an explanation as to what a neonate kitten is and the care involved for an animal like that? Sure. So neonatal kittens are newborn kittens and uh, they are fully dependent on their mothers. So uh, the care that is involved with them should be provided by their moms. Ideally, um, that's, you know, being nursed by their moms, being kept warm by their moms. Uh, but unfortunately, in the United States, what we're dealing with is a large quantity of kittens being born on our community streets, and then picked up by people and brought into our shelter system. So we have a large quantity of orphaned kittens, in the United States. And it's not because they are truly orphaned. Typically, um, a lot of the time it is because people, well-meaning people pick them up and bring them into the shelter. So uh, the reason we have such a neonatal kitten crisis in this country is actually related to not having enough education about community cats on our streets and um, awareness that there are a lot of cats uh, you know, breeding outdoors in our neighborhoods and that you know we need to include them in our advocacy. Uh, we can talk all about that. But what happens is these kittens come into shelters. If they are not with their moms, then, you know, unfortunately, the average animal shelter does not have the capacity to care for a neonatal kitten. And that's because most shelters have operating hours. They're not there in the middle of the night with um, tons of staff doing neonatal kitten care at two in the morning. But, you know, these little kittens, these newborns, they do need to be fed um, around the clock. So they, if they're an orphan, they need to be provided a bottle with kitten formula and they are on um, a schedule depending on their age, but that could be anywhere from every two hours to every three or four hours, depending on how old they are. Um, you know, they, they need help being stimulated to go to the bathroom, something their mom would usually do by licking. But as foster parents, we stimulate them with a soft tissue um, you know, they need to be weighed regularly. So we're monitoring their progress. They need to be kept warm. Um, hypothermia is a huge issue in uh, the lives of these little kittens, especially if they're not with their moms, because uh, their moms keep them warm just through their body heat. Uh, so, you know, it's it's a challenge for an animal shelter. And that's not at all um, disparaging of animal shelters. Shelters, of course, are dealing with every single dog, rabbit, guinea pig that comes in the door and they don't have, you know, the the overnight staff and uh, capacity typically to provide care to neonatal kittens, which is why there is such a huge need for more advocacy in that uh, in that area and for people to uh, step up and help by fostering. Really signing up as a foster parent and providing that care in your home is the number one opportunity these kittens have to you know, have a chance at life. And uh, I think that right now is a very cool time because uh, everybody's staying home anyway. So a lot of people are 
kind of giving that a shot for the first time. And I, I hope that that's something people will, will realize actually they do have the ability to do not just during a pandemic, but uh, perhaps afterwards. Uh, we have kitten season coming up. I mean, unfortunately, in uh, a lot of communities, it doesn't really end. Uh, but kitten season is coming up for the majority of the country. Do you have any idea of uh, what we're going to be facing this year? You know, there's a lot of different factors playing into that. And it's very interesting. So uh, this year, I think, on many different measures of different uh, data and in different industries, you're going to see all sorts of upset because of the pandemic and um, animal welfare is no exception. Uh, I think that on the one hand, you have um, over the last, I would say, you know, five to 10 years, a, a major uh, uprise in community cat programs and people sterilizing cats outdoors. And so we're seeing in those communities, the numbers of uh, kittens decreasing, which is really positive. There's so tons of data. Actually, I looked, I just cited the other day, the Best Friends TNR Success Stories uh, web page was, was great for um, seeing numbers of kittens declining uh, in communities that have those programs. Um, of course, in communities that don't have TNR programs, we do still see numbers rising. Um, so that is unfortunate. Uh, but then the other thing that we have right now is during the pandemic, we have on the one hand, an increase in foster homes, which is great. So more life-saving outcomes for the individual kittens who are entering our shelter system. But on the flip side, we have a decrease in spay-neuter access. So um, I think that we're sort of expecting to see more kittens being born because of that. So, uh, you know, it's it's challenging. It's frustrating. It's It's nobody's fault. We're all trying to kind of uh, deal with this as it comes and keep ourselves and our communities safe. Uh, but yeah, it is definitely um, a setback for us to not be able to do as much spay neuter because obviously the, you know, I don't need to give you the birds and the bees talk to help anybody understand that, you know, without spay neuter, uh, you're going to have more babies. Um, so yeah, I think I think it is positive that right now we have more foster homes. So those kittens that are born, you know, should hopefully more of them should have um, life-saving outcomes. And there's certainly a, a large trend towards kitten fostering right now. Uh, but I just wish that that could be partnered with increased spay neuter. And, and hopefully that's what we'll see on the horizon as we're able to open up those services more. You know, the foster part of neonates, I think that's something all organizations need help with making the case to, you know, even your seasoned fosters who may say, hey, I'm, I'm ready for another litter. Give me eight week olds. Sure. <laughs> How do we move the eight yeah. weekers to people who are going to be your neonate fosters? That's a great question. I think there's um, a couple of things. So um, the major barriers to fostering for people um, there are three things that I think are major barriers for fostering neonatal kittens. Um, one is just access to supplies. The supplies can be um, expensive or difficult to find or just not things that people have on hand, um, which is why a huge part of our grant program, my nonprofit, Orphan Kitten Club, um, we do grants for our partner organizations to help them get foster kits. Um, so like really beautiful kits that they can give to foster parents so that that's not an expense you're asking your foster parents to take on. Um, and those kits include things like bottles, formula, baby blankets, um, baby wipes, a scale, uh, you know, all of the different things like that that you need for a kitten. Um, so certainly access to supplies is a big place that people can, um, organizations can start trying to uh, increase their their capacities. I think if you're an organization and you have a donor base, that's a really beautiful thing that you can ask somebody to sponsor. Um, you know, ask somebody to sponsor, would you um, create 10 kitten kits for us, 10 neonatal kitten kits? And then that can be, um, some, that could be the difference between someone saying yes and somebody saying no. Um, the other big thing that I think people need in order to kind of have the buy-in of fostering neonates is medical care. Uh, it is not a strong area in the veterinary community. Pediatric care, especially for orphaned neonates, is um, it's a, kind of been a blind spot in the veterinary community. And I think that 
on the vet side, if you are um, working in that in that realm, um, definitely, you know, being somebody who uh, is willing to work with neonates and is willing to sort of think outside the box and try different different treatments and um, be really progressive in the work that you do, that's going to suit your community really well because, you know, um, that's a major reason people either don't foster or don't continue fostering is that they, you know, have a bad experience uh, with just either lack of veterinary care or with a veterinarian who, for instance, is not willing to uh, prescribe treatment that could be life-saving to a neonate. Um, so I think that's another huge area of need is medical, so supplies, medical, and then the third is education. Um, if you have people who don't feel that they are uh, educated about what to do, then of course you're not going to have them say yes. I would never take on an animal if I didn't have access to um, educational information about what to actually do with them. That's very scary. Um, and so that is really where the Kitten Lady Project comes in is I try to create all of that so that if you're um, you know, a small animal shelter with four staff, you don't have to sit there and create all these educational materials. They already exist at kittenlady.org or on my YouTube channel, or people can um, get a copy of my book, which is called Tiny But Mighty. Tiny But Mighty is more than 300 pages of information about how to take care of um, neonatal kittens. So uh, I create these resources all day, every day. All I'm thinking of is like, what can I um, put out there for people so that these things exist? So um, really, I think that's the three big points that organizations can work on is make sure you have educational materials. And by the way, um, in 2016, I did a survey of, uh, of people who foster kittens, and I asked some important questions. And one of them was, when you uh, fostered kittens for your shelter, did they give you any educational take-home materials? And more than half of people said no. So in 2016, I created a booklet called Orphan Kittens, and it's a 12-page booklet, and it is free. Um, and any animal shelter can get it for free, printed copies, like beautiful color copies that I will mail to you for free. Um, and you can get that at kittenlady.org slash booklet. Uh, that booklet has, over the last four years, been used by like over a thousand different um, organizations and vet clinics. Um, you can also print it out as a PDF or email it to someone. Uh, but educational materials are so, so important. So yeah, increasing education, increasing access to supplies, making sure that people are going to be supported medically. Um, I think that those three things are something that every organization should be thinking about. And then, you know, the last is just really actually speaking honestly about what's going on. You know, if, if people don't know there's an issue, then they don't feel empowered to help. So I think um, speaking honestly, but also speaking always with that message of hope, um, you never want to put out on social media communications or whatever, you know, I, the, the number one piece of advice, which I think Best Friends does a beautiful job um, in terms of sort of your like marketing and branding and communication strategy of like, you never put out a sad issue without a hopeful message of how to um, change it and a positive call to action. During the pandemic, uh, you know, I know you work with partner organizations. What are you seeing across the country and what are you recommending right now uh, as we're going through this? Yeah, we, so my organization, Orphan Kitten Club, we have um, partner organizations throughout the country that we support and we are in communication with them, encouraging that um, adoptions don't stop because some organizations, um, and I've seen on social media, people saying, you know, oh, well, we can't do adoptions uh, while we're in the pandemic, either because they are not able to access spay neuter or because they don't feel that they can um, do adoptions safely. And I strongly encourage organizations not to cease adoptions at this time. I Nobody's taking this pandemic more seriously than I am. Like literally, if you come within 10 feet of me, I'm like, get back. <laughs> I have my mask and my gloves. Um, we stay home 100% of the time unless I'm going to the vet or shelter. Um, but there is a way to do it. And I've done many adoptions um, since the pandemic started. So we created on our website at orphankittenclub.org slash covid some information for organizations to uh, learn about no contact adoptions because 
Um, you know, a lot of people are concerned about how to do that, but you can do it safely. Uh, what I do at my home and every home is going to be different, but I have a glass door. So uh, right in front of my glass door, I put out a little folding table with all of the kittens um, paperwork and we send them home with like a goodie bag that has toys and stuff. Uh, and then once the adopter uh, shows up, they text me and then I put the kitten into a cardboard carrier, put them on the table. The I go inside. The person can come up and grab all of their stuff. We have gloves on the table. We have um, sanitizing stuff on the table. And, uh, you know, I'm able to say hello through the glass, uh, but I'm not able to give them a hug, which is probably the hardest part of it. Um, but you can totally still do adoptions. And um, I encourage organizations to figure out the way that works best for them. Uh, in terms of spay neuter, that's definitely been a big issue, especially with these little kittens, because you know, I mean, I think my biggest concern when it comes to the lack of spay neuter access during the pandemic and kitten fostering is that kittens typically come in a pack, you know, they come in a litter. And a lot of the time there are mixed sex litters. So you have like two females and three males or something. And, you know, if you are holding on to your kittens in foster care and you're not adopting them out, you're asking your foster parents to potentially deal with kittens who are going to be reaching sexual maturity in foster care with opposite sex litter mates. Um, I really encourage organizations not to do that. Uh, yes, it is not fun to do these foster to adopts where we have to follow up and, um, you know, do the making sure that they get spayed and neutered once they are in their home. But I would much rather you adopt out either your single kittens or your paired kittens who are same sex um, into homes where they're not then exposed to a bunch of other foster kittens of the opposite sex who are all reaching sexual maturity around the same time. Um, I hope that that makes sense. That's just like a huge fear for me that we're going to have foster homes with pregnant teen foster kittens. I mean, it's just a nightmare situation. So, um, you know, intake is not stopping. So adoptions shouldn't stop either. We just have to be flexible. We have to sort of pivot uh, in this time. And, you know, I think as animal rescuers, we are some of the most flexible people in the world because none of this stuff happens on a planned schedule. Nothing happens within your control. We're all sort of having to pivot all the time in animal welfare. So uh, I think most of us are good for it, you know? You run an organization called uh, Orphan Kitten Club, and it does several amazing things. Uh, people can learn about all of them. There'll be a link on our website, bestfriends.org slash podcast. But I want to focus on the time, with the time that we have on the Mighty Cat Grant Program. That is a program really centered around our belief that every single kitten deserves a chance to be a mighty cat. And that includes kittens who have medical needs. That includes kittens who are in communities where um, they're very vulnerable and they need um, better services. And so what we do uh, with our mighty cat program, we started uh, this program as a pilot a little over a year ago. And um, we piloted it with just a couple organizations. Now we have um, about 30 Mighty Cat partners throughout the United States. We um, heavily vet our partner organizations. So we make sure that we're working with organizations that are, um, you know, sound organizations that are financially responsible, that are doing good work, that are aligned with all of our principles. Um, once you become a Mighty Cat partner organization, uh, which is currently invitation only, but people are welcome to um, send information to our email. Um, we, we always are happy to take a look at different organizations. Um, and once you become a Mighty Cat partner, you're eligible for a couple different types of grants. Um, the first type of grant that we do is our individual kitten grants. Those are open all year round for our partners so that um, if they take in a kitten who has a medical need, we are able to uh, sponsor those kittens. So for instance, if one of our partner organizations gets in a kitten who needs an enucleation, uh, they can reach out to us with a very, very quick application because again, these are partners. So we already know all of their, we have their, you know, their info. We just need the info on the specific case. Um, they can apply and 
um, just submit some very basic information about the kitten and their prognosis and, you know, the vet records for the kitten. And then we can make a determination. Um, in most cases, we are able to fund, um, you know, surgeries, things like nucleations, um, amputations, uh, you know, we do all sorts of different kinds of surgeries, kittens with congenital uh, conditions, things like that. So that's open year round for our partners. And then we also have our program grants, which um, we're thinking will probably be two to three grant cycles a year. Um, the program grants are our larger grants that are up to $25,000. And those are for, um, you know, innovative programs that organizations would like to start um, or to, uh, you know, shift uh, within their organizations. And so um, those grants, they typically are funding things like perhaps the kitten kits or perhaps a seasonal staff member to take care of kittens or to run a foster program. Uh, we've funded things like literally like physically building a nursery um, or uh, buying equipment for nurseries. Our partners really range in size and we do that intentionally because we want to make an impact um, regionally. So we have partners all over the country. And then we also want to make an impact um, in terms of different types of organizations. So some of them are large, uh, large municipal facilities. Some of them are small rescue facilities. Um, a lot of them are somewhere in the middle. Uh, but we, we take in those grant applications um, when we have our cycles. And we have a wonderful team of people that we've assembled um, an advisory board of people who have a lot of grant making experience uh, and also veterinarian and, you know, shelter folks. Um, so we're able to look at them and really assess how we can make the greatest impact. And I'm so proud of that program. Like I said, we piloted it a little over a year ago. Um, and in that time, we've given out more than $250,000 to um, our partner organizations. And that is uh, something that we hope will only grow. Um, as the founder of Orphan Kitten Club, I can tell you I never uh, set out to have a grant program. But uh, what we found is that we we were able to um, raise so much money for the programs that we did have that we really had to shift and re-envision, you know, okay, what can we do here? Because it's not like we just want to say, please don't donate to us, right? If we have something that's working, if we have the ability to raise these funds, then let's become a really um, fiscally responsible organization that can say, hey, you know, even if somebody wants to donate a large sum of money to us, we can do something and have a program where I can actually promise you that's going to make a big impact. And so we piloted it to see how that would go. And it, it has been so successful. We have organizations all over the country who are so grateful, who have changed their entire programs because of the grants that they've received from us, um, who've been able to hire staff because of those grants, who've been able to build out rooms in their shelters because of those grants. And so, um, you know, as somebody who's thinking about this from all different perspectives, from the fundraising side, from the program side, um, it, what's important to me is being able to show our donors what an impact that makes. So we look for partners who are able to really like do the follow up and provide us with uh, the, the images that we can show our donors so people see this is making a massive impact. And then, you know, hopefully, uh, the sky is the limit there. The more donors that we receive, the more grants we'll be able to do. And um, our most recent grant cycle, we did an emergency grant cycle for um, the pandemic because we realized that so many organizations are having to kind of um, get all of their animals out into foster. So we did a smaller grant cycle for grants up to $5,000 for our partners, just specifically to buy foster kits. Um, for their for their foster parents. So um, we just did that and we uh, sent out about $65,000 to um, our organizations that applied um, so that they could fund foster kits. And uh, it's just so cool to be tagged in photos of all of that and to see the impact that that's making and to know that like, you know, every donor that, that donates to us and I'm sitting there writing the thank you cards, like this is not just uh, it, it, it's, it's not like, oh, your name just goes in a database and, you know, we're not sure what happens to your $5. Like I see your $5 
um, purchasing a scale for a small organization in Georgia that wouldn't have been able to do it without you. And that's why when I write thank you on the card, like it's sincere, you know. And so organizations that are interested in maybe becoming a recipient, what do they need to do? Sure. So we are, like I said, we're invitation only at this time, but we are always looking for more organizations. You know, we have our, um, our board meetings where we, we discuss what our strategy is. And right now, you know, because we are a year out from um, our initial pilot of this program, we're now looking ahead to the future at what we really, how we want to see this grow now that we know it's successful. And now that we have our systems in place, um, obviously you can't like run a program if you don't have uh, your systems in place. So now that we feel like we have all of that set, we're really trying to envision what impact we want to make in the country. And I can tell you, um, we're always looking for things, especially in, in regions that we don't have um, partners. Uh, I, I have a really strong interest in uh, the South, for instance. Um, the South is uh, an area that um, I've done a lot of work in, and I know that there's a, a great need. Um, kitten season lasts longer, starts earlier, ends later, um, and there's not always um, enough funding for organizations there. So I would say, especially Southern organizations are um, encouraged to reach out. Um, you know, we don't have applications open, uh, but we do read our emails. And if you send some information, um, we only will work with organizations that specifically already work with neonates. So um, not an organization that's like, you know, we want to work with neonates, but if you can show that you have, you know, a track record of working with neonatal kittens, whether that is on site or in a foster program, um, you're totally encouraged to uh, go on our website and send us an email with some information and um, you know, one, when we open applications up, um, we can send out information to you. Uh, but yeah, we're, we are thinking that we will be able to expand our partners this year. So it's pretty cool. It's, uh, surprising and lovely. And, uh, yeah. having worked for a lot of nonprofits in the past, I can tell you, I've, I've seen it all. And I, I really, uh, it feels very important to me to be an organization that feels like uh, it has like an equal balance of heart and, and mind. And we're able to um, be really strategic and really loving and compassionate and uh, just really effective with people's dollar. Cause like I said, I'm also a donor to other organizations. I want to know that my dollar is going, going as far as it can. And it feels really good to be able to tell people that like, from the bottom of my heart, when you donate to Orphan Kitten Club, your dollar is going as far as we can possibly make it go. Hannah, thank you very much. Well, again, we'll have all of the information that you talked about uh, on the website. So organizations, individuals can get all of that. And, you know, do you have any parting words, particularly for organizations who uh, may be uh, carrying the concerns of COVID, uh, a little bit of fear of the unknown? Uh, what can you say to them uh, in terms of you know, their kitten season and, and how they're going to be able to manage going forward. I actually, this is going to sound crazy, but I actually have some very positive feelings about the future um, as related to the pandemic. I think that uh, the pandemic has really forced a lot of issues for all of us. Um, it has forced us to uh, change in ways that some of them are very scary, but some of them I hope are uh, eye-opening and maybe make permanent change. Uh, I think in so many different in so many different industries, the pandemic has been able to shine a light on weak points uh, that we already had that now we can try to uh, strengthen. And I think that it has also uh, helped us see things that we weren't seeing before. So, for instance, um, you know, I think that. In animal welfare, one positive of this is that I think more people will shift towards fostering. And uh, that's such a positive thing because uh, my dream for the future of animal sheltering is that we don't need animals in shelters, that, you know, these, these are community-based problems with community-based solutions. As far as I'm concerned, every animal should be going straight out to a foster home. And uh, you think about orphanages, right? We, we used to have orphanages where kids would 
go be in a facility. Now, we don't really have that in the same way. We have the foster care system. We have social services. We have case management services. We have, um, you know, supports in our counties that can help children who are in need, but we are not, you know, putting them into a facility. So the more we can deinstitutionalize uh, animal welfare, I think the better. And I think that this is kind of forcing that issue. I hope that it never goes back. I don't want to return to animals in kennels. I want to return to, uh, I want to, I want to look ahead and uh, have there be animals in foster. And I think that this is such a good time to use all of this, uh, use all of this tension and all of this crisis for good. So what can we do to take this, uh, take the fact that, you know, this is all over the news right now. This is all over social media right now. This is on people's minds right now. How can we use that to reel people in and get everybody invested and then hold on to them, hold on to them so that in the future uh, we go, wow, that actually really forced an issue that perhaps uh, we wouldn't be in such a positive place now if we hadn't been forced to uh, help people see that, yeah, these are these are things that can have community based solutions. So I feel really positive about the future, um, even if right now it feels very scary. Uh, I think that. I think as organizations, the very best thing we can be doing is like using all of all of the tension and all of the crisis that's going on for uh, for for good and organizing, like just getting yourself organized so that, you know, in the future, we're going to have an even safer world for animals than we did in the past. Yeah. And what is the role of shelters? This is like a whole other hour. Oh, I can keep talking. My my 12 o'clock. I'm not even kidding. My 12 o'clock got canceled. So. Perfect. Let's go. Um, so, so we um, shelters are a safety net, right? And that's hopefully as as the way we look at them. What is the shelter's role in the community? Uh, everybody keeps talking about the new normal and what is the future of sheltering. But just think for a second that we know that the community is a big part of solving the problem, right? Of helping us save lives. I mean, that's is fosters, adopters. Now, in this case, we said. We need you because our doors are closed, essentially, right? And who stepped up? The community. What if a year from now, when COVID, at least what we know now in terms of the stay-at-home orders, quarantines, the door is still open, what if we said, let's act like we did during COVID? 100%. I think that that's really, really true. I think, um, you know, we can, we sort of have a, an awesome opportunity here to shift the public's understanding of how these services ought to work because too often in the past it the shelter sort of served as a dumping ground for the problems of the community but an, an animal shelter can't do all of this with you know a handful of staff and a handful of rooms and i always tell people you know the shelter has limited square footage but when we open our homes we increase the square footage exponentially. Um, the whole community should be the animal shelter. A shelter shouldn't be a building. A shelter should be a community, right? Um, so I think, yeah, there's there's so much room to try to really turn shelters into resource centers rather than pounds, you know. Using neonates as an example of this, I think it's a great one. So someone who cared enough about them, you know, they wanted to see them live and brought them to a shelter as, you know, with the belief that that would be uh, a way for them to live. Now, what if instead of shelters taking them in, uh, like giving them the option uh, with the support to to help them, to save them themselves? So, you know, did you know you can help them? Here are these resources. Uh, kitten ladies, obviously. Uh, but, you know, how many of those people will say yes? I will do this. I do have some data around that. Um, I have talked with a lot of organizations that have intervention programs like that, where they put somebody in front of the door. And if people try to bring kittens in, they stop them and say, let me train you how to do this. Let me send you home with some supplies. And um, the, the success rate for the organizations I've talked with is around 40%. So around 40% of people, if you bring, if they bring a kitten into an animal shelter, thinking they're helping them by dropping them off, 
if given supplies and information and a little bit of training will actually become the foster parent. And um, and 40% and 40%, that's the uh, grades that I used to get in college. And those were definitely <laughs> failing grades. <laughs> but in this context, 40% is really incredible. It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. I mean, think if you, if you didn't have to recruit that volume of people because you recruit them from finders. I believe in my 2016 survey, uh, 76% of people who foster kittens say that they started by finding a kitten outside, not by signing up to foster. And that is, uh, I'm included in that 76%. It's not like one day I thought I should sign up to foster kittens. What happened for me was one day I found a kitten in a tree and I was like, okay, what do I do here? And that was how I fostered my first kitten. Um, well, that's my cat Coco, who I still have now, and she's 11 years old. Uh, but, um, you know, that's how I got involved was by finding one. And so we need to give people the benefit of the doubt that if you find a kitten outside and you're trying to help that kitten, uh, a lot of those people can become our best foster parents. So let's give them that opportunity rather than just saying, okay, we'll take them in. You know, sometimes I think in animal welfare, we're so used to thinking that we have to do everything and we're the only ones who can do it. Uh, but that's not true. Anybody can learn how to do this stuff. And we really ought to empower the community much more. Thank you to Hannah for sharing with us and congrats on all the great things happening with Orphan Kitten Club. Again, on our website, we've pulled together all the links to all of the things bestfriends.org slash podcast. The producers of the Best Friends podcast, Tawny Hammond, Amy Charlton, and Mark Peralta. Please take care of yourselves and each other and be safe. I'm John Dunn, and this is the Best Friends podcast.